Hello everyone and welcome back to Microbiology. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 3, The Cell, Part 2. In the first half of this lecture we discuss LPS. LPS is a component of gram-negative cell walls and it helps increase cell membrane stability. It also helps protect the bacteria from certain toxins. I just wanted to show an image of what this LPS structure looks like to kind of give you an idea of that as well as where the name comes from. So lipo comes from the fact that it has lipid molecules. And so we're looking from kind of the end of the LPS molecule to what's embedded in the membrane here. So you see lipid A, um, lipids uh, like attracts like. So you can see these lipids um, stick into the membrane very well. So that's the lipo component. And then polysaccharide, sac meaning sugar and poly meaning many. So the other components are this core and this O antigen. And these are made up of different sugar molecules represented by these different shapes, depending on the type of sugar molecule it is. And they're linked in a polymer and therefore we have our LPS. And right here is just a, another image of it. Uh, you're not going to have to know in this grade of detail about uh, how LPS looks like, but you hear, here we see the, the lipid A component, and these are the fatty acid chains, and they're linked here to these sugars and other sorts of sugars here. Okay, this slide here is a repeat of information we've seen before. Uh, again, comparing prokaryotes to eukaryotes. They differ in their DNA location, their chromosomes, uh, how many copies they usually have, and the shape of them, the way their DNA is packaged, either with or without proteins, uh, the uh, membrane-bound organelles. Uh, prokaryotes tend not to have any membrane-bound organelles, whereas eukaryotes always have many, uh, including the nucleus here. Uh, the types of material that are in the cell walls, prokaryotes have that peptidoglycan, and eukaryotes lack peptidoglycan, but have others like chitin cellulose. And replication is through binary fission for prokaryotes. And in eukaryotes, it's mitosis. So let's apply this knowledge to our first checkpoint, checkpoint one. You have isolated a gram-positive cell with an endospore and no visible nucle nucleus. Is this a prokaryotic or eukaryotic cell? How do you know? Name at least two reasons. So by now you've heard me mention membranes several times. And let's look at what membranes are in a little bit more detail. So this image right here shows a cellular membrane. And as you can see, it appears as sort of a sheet of molecules that are linked to each other. And the way that this membrane stays intact is very similar to how um, fats or oils might float on the top of the surface of, a, uh, of, of water. The reason for that, the reason why they float is because they are lighter than water. But the reason why they kind of group together is because like attracts like. So there are compounds that are called hydrophilic, and that means they love, their technically means, literally means lovers of water. And an exa the best example of that is water itself. Water tends to like to stick to itself. It doesn't like to hang out with um, hydrophobic compounds. Phobic meaning a fear of water. And those compounds are, are fatty acids, fats, oils, and a lot of uh, other types of hydrocarbons like waxes. And if you look at the image here on the left, these are those little molecules that make up the sheet kind of blown up. And they have um, three main parts to them. First, they have their fatty acid tails. So if you look at these lines that are drawn here, these are hydrocarbons. So it's carbon and hydrogen, and they're linked in a polymer here. And 
uh, not quite a polymer actually. They're, they're linked in a chain is what this is called. And these do not like water. The reason why they don't like water is that they don't have much of a charge to them. Like this phosphate group, you see this oxygen has a negative charge to it. These don't have any oxygens and just as carbon and hydrogen alone, they don't carry a charge and therefore they don't like to interact with water, but they don't mind the company of each other. So as a consequence, if you took a bunch of these individual uh, fat uh, um, phospholipids is what they're called, and you shook them up and threw them in a solution of water, they would auto separate and form these sorts of sheets with each other. Um, the other components here is a glycerol backbone, and we see glycerol is just a three-chained uh, molecule right here, or a three-carbon molecule. It's got three carbons, and then this O, C, double O group that bonds to this, um, these fatty acids. So this glycerol component is responsible for binding the fatty acids. But it also binds another component. Whoops. It binds to this phosphate group. And if you remember, I said that this phosphate group has these oxygens around it, and these oxygens can have a negative charge. That means that they have an excess in electrons. We kind of discussed negative charges and positive charges when we talked about dyes. So this has a stronger a negative charge than the rest of the molecule. And so do you hypothesize that this would be more attracted to water molecules or unattracted? Would it be more hydrophilic or hydrophobic? The answer is it would be more hydrophilic. So if you were to put these in a solution of water, the phosphate groups would point towards the water and the fatty acids would point away from the water. So what's so neat about these is it forms what we call a phospholipid bilayer. So these tails would rather be hidden than sticking out. And so what they do is they form a, a bilayer where uh, one set of, of these phospholipids is on the top with the tails pointing in and another set is on the bottom with the tails pointing in as well. So they shield the tails from water and the phosphates are exposed to uh, the aqueous portions. And if you look over on the right hand side, you can see cytoplasmin, plasm. So the cytoplasm is that liquid portion of the inside of the cell. So you see these phosphate groups point in towards that and that's fine because they are hydrophilic. And the other set of phosphate groups point outward. And as we know, cells uh, live in aqueous solutions. They live in the ocean. Uh, we have cells in our body. We have cells in, in marine and aquatic habitats, et cetera, et cetera. So these cells that are on the outside do just find is, or, or sorry, these phospholipids that have the phosphate groups on the outside of the cell conveniently also can be exposed to water and it doesn't interfere with the integrity of this membrane. Now, it might appear as though these uh, phospholipids are bound to each other. Um, that actually is not the case. They are not bound to each other. This right here is what we call the fluid mosaic model. It's like one of those little playgrounds that has a bunch of, a ball, of balls inside of it. Those little balls that you can jump into are not attached to each other. They're just closely packed into each other. So each one of these phospholipid molecules can float around in this plane and they're not really kept or bound anywhere. So there's this fluidity that exists in this, uh, in this cell. So mosaic uh, refers to the appearance of this membrane and fluidity or fluid refers to the fluidity within the plane of the membrane. Um, so this membrane actually, they all don't look like the exact same phospholipid either. Some of these carbons in here 
have double bonds and some of them have single bonds. A carbon is represented by each point in this squiggly line. So some of them can be have two bonds connecting one carbon to the other and bonds are just the sharing of electron pairs. Sometimes they just have single bonds. Sometimes these chains are longer or shorter than other chains. So if you've ever heard of different fatty acids that you, you need that are essential to your body, um, that's what it's referring to is different lengths and different sorts of uh, double bonds and single bonds. So this structure right here uh, in general represents what bacterial uh, membranes look like. Um, uh, archaeal membranes are a little bit different. And I want you to notice that this fluid, fluid mosaic model does include other things besides just the phospholipids. As you can see, it has these uh, um, proteins that allow for exchange of components. Uh, it has receptors and other things that are used for attachment or uh, helping to stabilize the membrane. And we're gonna get into some of these other components here. Okay, so let's talk about proteins. Uh, hopefully you already know what proteins are from previ previous biology courses that you have taken. At least um, you sh all should have had a high school biology before taking this class. And as you can see in this image, there are uh, two different uh, types of proteins. There are peripheral membrane proteins and there are, there are integral membrane proteins. Peripheral membrane proteins float along the outside or the inside of the mem membrane, but not they are not embedded inside of the membrane at all. Um, these are important for passing um, different components along the membrane, which we'll talk about later when we look at uh, ATP synthesis and the uh, electrochemical gradient. Um, they uh, uh, are also important for uh, moving electrons from one protein to another, and um, sometimes even for recruiting other membranes to be assimilated or integrated into the membrane. Next, we see the integral membranes. We have two types of integral membranes. Some integral membranes are just embedded on one side of the phospholipid bilayer and others, which are called transmembrane, meaning they cross the membrane, go through both bilayers. So the membrane is a way that the cell protects itself from the outside world, but it's also a gateway for deciding what molecules can come in and which molecules can leave the cell. Um, so there are a few ways that this can be done. One is simple diffusion. And this is like how we discuss with um, osmosis. Simple diffusion are molecules that are small enough that they are able to just pass through the membrane without any sort of help. So you can imagine water molecules could do that. Uh, small molecules like carbon dioxide can do that as well. So um, if there is more of something on the outside than on the inside, you will have chemicals move in across the membrane in order to create a homeostasis or a balance um, of the amount of molecules inside and outside. And just to point out here, it kind of defines it in the book as, as this way, it says simple diffusion down a concentration gradient. And a concentration gradient is, so here's a greater concentration and a lower concentration. So this is a concentration gradient down into the cell. Directly across the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, next up is passive diffusion, or tr sorry, passive transport. This is not diffusion or it's not simple diffusion. So the way this works is the cell can have these protein channels. You might remember that these are transmembrane proteins 
And these are big enough that you can actually have uh, larger molecules fit through them. Uh, sometimes they're a particular size that they only allow certain types of molecules to pass through. Um, but they are, are slightly limited in, in the types of molecules that are allowed to pass through these, these regions. Uh, and um, this mechanism occurs the same way uh, simple diffusion does, and then it goes across a concentration gradient. So you can see these molecules are going inside of the cell because there's less of them inside of the cell than outside of the cell. Now, sometimes the cell wants to import things that there might be a lower concentration outside than inside. This can be certain uh, um, simple elements like sodium or potassium or chloride, those sorts of things. It can also be things, other types of nutrients like sugars or amino acids or things like that that it wants to break down to make energy or build up other cellular components from. And this is actually going against a concentration gradient. So in order to accomplish this, um, because physics doesn't work against a concentration gradient, the cell has to expend some energy to make this happen. So in this example here, um, the cell wants to get rid of some sodium. So it uses ATP. I'm sure you've all heard ATP is the energy currency of the cell. Essentially, you can break off a phosphate group from ATP and it creates a little bit of energy. And in doing so, you can use that energy to do some work. Okay, so you can pump out or you can pump potassium in, um, basically any way you wanna pump something, but you have to expend a little bit of energy in order to get it done. So these are called pumps. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about bacteria at this point. Let's go ahead and move on to the eukaryotic cells. And the eukaryotic cells uh, contain a lot of um, organisms on this list of type of microbes. They contain the fungi, the protozoa, the algae, the helminths, and they even contain animals. Um, again, this is just a review of some of the differences, so we're going to focus in on some of these here for the eukaryotes, their nucleus, their linear multiple chromosomes, their histones, which are used for packing. We're going to talk a lot about their different membrane-bound organelles, which really sets them aside from the prokaryotes. And uh, mitosis, uh, we're not going to cover in great detail. Um, I am going to have an image of that for your own review, for those of you that need to catch up a little bit on your uh, high school biology. So, like bacteria, eukaryotes may possess long singular appendages that are called flagella. However, they also have short numerous ones called cilia, and both of these are used for propulsion. So here we can see the uh, little cilia coming off or these longer flagellum. And this is um, a kind of the basic structure of a uh, eukaryotic cell. As we'll talk about later, you see a lot of these different types of membranes that exist inside of the cell. These membranes allow it to compartmentalize different processes and tasks. So prokaryotes do not have cilia um, eukaryotes and prokaryotes have flagella, which differ in size, the chemical composition of those flagella, and also the way they move. So, checkpoint two. Pili are associated with blank, and cilia are associated with blank. Eukary eukaryotes, eukaryotes. Oops. Prokaryotes, prokaryotes. Eukaryotes, prokaryotes, or prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Sorry about that, that should be a little bit better. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the cell wall briefly. Plant cell walls are made up of cellulose 
and that gives them a very rigid structure. You often see them just kind of a, a square shape, and that's due to the cellulose, which provides a lot of rigidity. Um, fungal cell walls are made of chitin, and this is very important. Animal cells and protozoa lack a, uh, a cell wall. So they do still have membranes, but they don't have these other components that would make a cell wall. So some structures both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have. Um, these are things such as the cytoplasm, nucleus, and ribosomes. I think we discussed ribosomes already. It's where protein synthesis occurs. And please remember uh, the size of the prokaryotic is 70S. Um, however, an important evolutionary component that was developed um, by eukaryotes enabled spatial separation, regulation, and membrane-related biochemistry to take place. These structures are called organelles, and they are complex membrane-bound structures. Um, some of them you see on this list are the lysosomes, peroxisome, Golgi complex, uh, even this uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic uh, reticulum, the uh, nucleus, and uh, let's see, mitochondrion. Uh, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely uh, many of them. We also can have other structures, but that's a, that's a list that most, micro, most eukaryotes contain. Okay, so um, ribosomes for eukaryotic cells. They contain what we call an ADS ribosome, that's that Svedberg unit. So they are, are a little bit heavier, they tend to precipitate a little bit lower in that ultra centrifugation that we discussed and that's in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, as we call it. And these are membrane-bound ribosomes. And, uh, and also in the cytoplasm, we have free ribosomes. So they also contain the 70S ribosomes, just as prokaryotes do, but these are found in specific organelles of eukaryotes. They are found in the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. So it's a little bit confusing there, but we're going to discuss why they do have the 70S ribosomes, which are supposed to be just prokaryotic. Here is a comparison chart that I've made. So I recommend uh, jotting these down, putting, those on, putting this on those note cards I discussed keeping on you. And um, you'll need to remember the domains, sizes of their, uh, their main ribosomes. So for eukarya, it's ADS, prokarya, it's 70S, and archaea, 70S. And this image here just highlights some of the many membrane-bound organelles in a eukaryote. So there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There are the rough and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle made of a network of lipid bilayer. The two types, first, the smooth ER, plays a role in lipid synthesis. Um, when when uh, cells create something, we call this biosynthesis, meaning from life. So they play a role in lipids biosynthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, and de detoxification of toxic compounds. Rough ER is studded with membrane-bound ADS ribosomes that synthesize proteins. And the reason why they call it rough ER is because under images, it looks rough due to those ADS ribosomes that stud the membrane. So we have both smooth and rough. 
Next up are the lysosomes and peroxisomes. So these are uh, two different organelles that have a very high enzymatic activity. And we're going to discuss here what each one of them does. The lysosome, lys means to break apart. So it contains digestive enzymes and enzymes are just catalysts, they're biocatalysts that cause reactions to occur. And so they, these digestive enzymes, they cause reactions that break down small particles ingested via endocytosis. Endocytosis is when a cell basically eats something. Endo means in, cyto means the cell. So when the cells consume something, these large particles go to the lysosome and the cells uh, digest them. This can also occur through uh, phagocytosis. And uh, cells also need to do this in order to break down damaged machinery, so other intracellular components. Um, maybe proteins that have started to, to get old and denature or other, other things like that will be sent to the lysosome in order to be broken down and recycled. Next up is the peroxisome, which has kind of a related task to the lysosomes. However, they're, they're most notably known for their degradation of fatty acids. Um, they do also break down amino acids. And where they get their namesake is that they have what we call reactive oxygen species, like hydrogen peroxide. So most of you are aware of hydrogen peroxide and it's used in first aid kits. So if you apply it to a wound, you see the bubbling occurring. And what that is, is it's the oxygen molecule and hydrogen peroxide reacting with components in a wound. So when it reacts with components, it does something called um, oxidizes it. And this oxidation is a very damaging reaction. And that's why it's good as an antiseptic because it will react with bacteria on a wound and cause uh, harm and damage to them and can kill them. Well, peroxisomes are kind of a controlled demolition inside of the cell. So if the cell uh, imports maybe some fatty acids it wants to break down or amino acids, uh, those reactive oxygen species um, will react with those compounds and help to break them down. And that's where it gets its name, peroxisome. This brings us to checkpoint three, true or false. Lysosomes are mainly known for their degradation of fatty acids. A, true, B, false. Okay, let's discuss the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus processes proteins and lipids. Now it's not breaking down proteins and lipids. It's just processing them before they can go on and do their further tasks in the cells. Um, typically it does this by adding sugar molecules to those proteins and lipids. And in doing so, it produces glycoproteins, so sugar proteins, or glycolipids or sugar lipids. Um, these are very important as components of the plasma membrane that are used in cell-to-cell -cell communication. This process is called glyco glycosylation, so the addition of a sugar molecule. Next up, we have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is a collection of structural proteins. These play a role in transport of intracellular components, of anchoring of components in the cell and the cell onto things, for contraction of the cell, which can be important for uh, motility, and to help maintain the cell shape. There are three main types that we're going to discuss and those are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and the microtubules.
Microfilaments are the smallest of the three. They are made of two intertwined strands called actin. So these are strands of protein and they only make up about seven nanometers in size. And if you will recall the size of a very small, a prokaryotic cell um, is usually on the range of somewhere about one, two, three micrometers. And it just appears as small as dots under the microscope at the highest power for a light microscope. So uh, one thousandth of a micrometer is a nanometer. So this is a very small um, thing in order to observe here, seven nanometers. And it can work in concert with a protein called myosin. You've probably heard that in before for muscles and it allows for a contraction. So these are found in muscle cells and can be used for contraction and also can be used in amoeba over here for motility. Amoeba have these little, what we call pseudopodia, which means false feet. And these will stick to a surface and the cell will have these micro filaments that move inward and downward. And as they do so, they pull the inner part of the cell up into the pseudopodia until the cell fills this space with the pseudopodia. So in a way, it kind of pulls its insides up to that pseudopodia and the filaments kind of create a current where they come back down and move back in. So in and down, in and down, and that allows this organism to move across the surface. And that's okay if you uh, don't completely understand that mechanism, but you need to be aware that microfilaments play a role in that sort of uh, motility, that contraction mobility of pseudopodia. Okay, next up are the intermediate filaments. So these are a very diverse group of cytoskeletal filaments and they act as cables. They are a little bit bigger and that's why they're called intermediate. This has to do with the size. So they are a size of a 10 nanometer in diameter. So that's about the width of the phospholipid bilayer. And they're, uh, they're kind of between the size of actin and microtubules, which we'll talk about in the next slide. These are composed of several strands of amino acids. Um, so. Uh, so these strands are made of amino acids and there's several of those strands in an intermediate uh, fiber. And they can vary depending on the type of intermediate filament or IF. So again, they can be made of a wide variety of monomers. A monomer is a single unit in a polymer. So an amino acid can be a monomer in a polypeptide or a protein which are made up of several units of these monomer or amino acids. Um, these are a much more permanent fixture in cells um, and they help to maintain the position of components inside of the cell. So where the nucleus is, they help maintain the, the shape of the cell um, and they also help resist external pressures on the cell. And finally, they can help anchor the cells to other cells. So they can have these little fibers that come off the sides and then they can stick to other cells in order for attachment as seen here. Don't worry about the details here. Worry about what its function is. All right, now the microtubules. These are composed of tubulin dimers. So there's Two different proteins, okay, tubulin, alpha tubulin, and beta tubulin. That's what you're seeing over here in this image is those two different proteins, okay? And they form hollow tubes that are 23 nanometers in diameter. And these can be used as a type of frame, framework of the cell. These rapidly auto-assimilate and dissemble. And these act as a sort of a railway where motor proteins, proteins can move up and down in order to transport objects around the cell.
And here is just another image of tubulin. So this is a central mirror, which you will learn about when you uh, study mitosis. And this tubulin, as you can see, it just auto forms this uh, polymerization. So these just kind of are, are attracted to one another and they form these long tracks, these long uh, railways. And I have this image here just to show you how this motor protein can attach to this microtubule and move along it. And you can see it's carrying a, what we call a vesicle. A vesicle is just a little uh, um, ball of, uh, of a membrane that contains some sort of components inside of it. So the mitotic spindle also uses microtubules. So uh, when, when the cell is uh, separating its chromosomes here, represented as these X's, to different ends of the cell before it goes through cytokinesis in order to make two different cells, um, it forms these centrosomes at the polar ends of the cell. And these centrosomes attach themselves to the chromosomes here in order to pull these chromosomes to either and so you can see here how the microtubules play an essential role in uh, transporting and separating uh, the chromosomes. So, as I said, I was going to discuss very briefly mitosis and meiosis. These are the ways in which eukaryotes divide. Uh, prokaryotes um, divide through binary fission. Um, these are both types of, uh, re of replication, I should say. Mitosis occurs in uh, normal cells in your body. So this could be skin cells, this could be uh, bone cells, this could be, um, you name it, cells. Um, mitosis is basically a exact copy of one cell into two cells. Meiosis is a step in sexual reproduction. And this yields gametes in the process. So instead of making two of nearly the exact same cells from the original cell, you make gametes instead. And uh, for those of you that don't know, in humans, gametes, gametes are their uh, ova and sperm. Since bacteria do not perform these cycles and they don't have genders or sexual reproduction, they do not uh, do meiosis. And a little tip to memorize meiosis versus mitosis is meiosis, again, is a, is a step in sexual reproduction, which has a letter E in it. And meiosis also has a letter E in it. Mitosis does not. Again, very briefly, I'm going to cover um, kind of the difference in the cell cycle of mitosis and meiosis. Let's look at mitosis first because it's a little bit easier to understand. So in mitosis, here we have the original parental cell before chromosome duplication occurs. It says that it's a 2N cell. N means uh, how many chromosomes it has. So it has two copies, two different chromosomes See here? So this blue is one set of chromosomes. This orange is another set of chromosomes. And it has two different kinds of each chromosome. So it has one from, essentially like humans do, one from the mother and one from the father. So two kinds here. So you see four chromosomes floating in here. And two of them are kind of the same chromosomes. Uh, we probably understand this best when you think of your X and Y chromosomes. They are two of the, they are both the sex chromosome of humans. So imagine they're both these blue uh, chromosomes here. And one would be from the mother and one would be from the father. That applies for all of your uh, sets of chromosomes. So in this example, we have chromosome duplication. So each one of these chromosomes gets copied. Your mother's copy, gets a second exact copy made, and so does your father's copy. And this happens for each pair 
of your chromosomes. Then they align and men, so this is prophase. And by the way, this duplication, then this chromosome gets called a sister chromatid. Eventually we need to separate these so we have two exact cells. So they align and this metaphase, they align on the metaphase plate. And then we discuss those microtubules and the centrosome, which pulls these apart and it actually splits each copy down the middle so that now these copies look just like we did in the parent cell. And now we have two daughter cells in the process of mitosis. Meiosis is a lot more complicated than that. We have a meiosis one here and we have a meiosis two down here. So in meiosis one, we have what we call crossover. So you can imagine you have a chromosome duplication, which occurs just like it did over here in mitosis. And then we've already had that duplication occur in the cell. So in meiosis uh, prophase one, um, these duplicated chromosomes then get together. So your mommy's sister chromatids and your daddy's sister chromatids that match each other come together and they exchange a little DNA with each other. And so this is called homologous recombination. So essentially they say, hey, I'll give you some of this if you give me some of that. And so they swap genes with each other and that makes them a little bit uh, different. So they're no longer the same types of chromosomes they once were before. They're a little bit different. And that's what creates our uh, amount of diversity um, when we uh, procreate. So these, uh, these mommy and daddy sister chromatids get together. And here we see their, they call them tetrads. And they, in metaphase one, they align along this metaphase plate. But instead of being each one of them pulled apart, the sister chromatids stay together this time. And in this image here in mitosis, we saw sister chromatids get pulled apart from each other. All we're doing is we're pulling mommy and daddy sister chromatids away from each other. So we have this kind of uh, new bizarre setup in this cell where instead of having two copies of each chromosome, they have one copy of each sister chromatid. And if this is a little bit confusing, um, I would recommend maybe watching uh, some YouTube videos on it or something of that nature. There's a little bit more detail in the book too. And now at this point, now we're ready to kind of copy what was done in mitosis where we split apart these uh, sister chromatids. But by doing so, these gametes get produced and these gametes they're called gametes because they are they actually are half the number of each copy of the chromosome we had in the original cell. In the original cell, we had a mommy and a daddy copy for each chromosome, but we no longer have that example. Now we just have one of those for each chromosome in a cell. And each one is kind of a hybrid of mommy and daddy's chromosomes. The reason why we produce these gametes is because during sexual reproduction, you can imagine that an ova and a sperm that are both gametes, they both have only one copy or N equals one. They actually combine and fuse to make a new cell. And so once they combine, they can share their chromosomes with each other. So now for this one set of chromosomes, now they have a complete pair. Of chromosomes and same for this other set so two of these gametes can fuse together and if we look if we fuse them together it would look like this parent cell all over again all right it's time to switch bases to an organelle that goes through its own division via binary fission this organelle is called the mitochondria I'm sure everyone has heard of the mitochondria somewhere before. The mitochondria are the site of what we call aerobic cellular respiration and the majority of the cell's ATP production. In uh, normal 
terms, we've heard of this as the powerhouse of the cell. Well, they call it the powerhouse because it makes ATP, which can be used for little energy tasks, like we discussed with active transport. And it makes ATP through the process of aerobic cellular respiration. But we're gonna talk a lot more about this when we get into cellular metabolism. Here is the structure of a mitochondrion, and here's an electron microscope image of that of a mitochondrion as well. And the mitochondrion has some interesting features. Um, first, it has two membranes. It has an outer membrane, and it has an intermembrane. And this intermembrane, inner membrane, has a bunch of what we call cristae, and what these are are folds, uh, or we call them vaginations, of that intermembrane. And what that does is it helps to try and maximize the surface area of the membrane. As you can recall, I mentioned that one of the functions of membranes is to conduct membrane chemistry. And so this is kind of like a lab, and they're trying to maximize the amount of membrane surface they have so they can conduct more uh, membrane chemistry. And this is where ATP is formed along the membrane. Mitochondria then also have their own ribosomes. So these are the protein synthesis factories of our cells. So they have their own ribosomes that are unique than the rest of the ribosomes. And remember how I said that eukaryotes have ADS and 70S? This is the 70S ribosome. It's inside of this mitochondria. They also have an intermembrane space. So that's the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And they have their own DNA. Really interesting. So you might kind of wonder where these, uh, these organelles come from. Next, let's briefly talk about the chloroplasts. Uh, let me pause here and try and fix this image here. Okay, so the chloroplasts are part of a group of organelles referred to as plastids. This is a class of small organelles such as chloroplasts, which exists in the cytoplasm of plant cells, which is another type of eukaryotic cell, and they contain pigment or other types of plastids can be used to house uh, food or do other tasks. So chloroplasts, um, their function is to do photosynthesis within the cell of algae or plants. Okay, so here's a zoom in image of uh, the basic function and outline of a chloroplast. So again, it has an outer membrane and it has an inner membrane. Okay, now that includes the inner membrane space between the two. It has a, uh, uh, what we call uh, thylakoids and these thylakoids are another membrane that exists inside. And these thylakoids um, house the area where photosynthesis takes place, which is also another type of um, chemistry that takes place on the surface of membranes. Okay, and then it has the uh, stroma, which is kind of like the cytoplasm of the cell. And then it has the thylakoid lumen. The thylakoid lumen is the fluid inside of the thylakoids. Um, if you remember lumen like light, you might remember, okay, that's inside of the thylakoid itself. Thylakoids also are stacked very tightly. The way they uh, com compress them are through stacks called granum. So let's get this straight. Chloroplasts and mitochondria. Um, mitochondria have their own DNA, right? Um, so do chloroplasts. They have ribosomes. They, uh, they 
um, divide through binary fission, right? They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane, okay? And they're even about the same size as something we've discussed. So can anyone guess what these uh, organelles might be related to that we've already discussed in microbiology? They're very similar to bacteria. And a while back, scientists came up with this concept of endosymbiosis. So symb means to like live in harmony with something. And endo means to go in, like endocytosis was when a cell, cyto, endo, or consumes or eats something from the outside. So this theory is one that uh, um, states that mitochondria and chloroplasts arose from prokaryotes that were engulfed by a eukaryote and then lived in symbiosis. So that's a very basic concept of it. Um, there are some good reasons to think this. One is the size of the chloroplasts and mitochondria are about one by two, two and a half microns, which is about the size of a bacterium. They also have uh, ribosomes and the ribosomes are similar in structure and the amino acid residue sequences are similar. And uh, there's a field of, of um, proteomics and that studies proteins and their relatedness to other protein families. And so proteins evolve over time to become different types of proteins with different activities. And so the proteins in the ribosome are similar and they're in a family tree that would be most closely related to prokaryotes and not to the eukaryotic ribosomes. Also, as we discussed, the membrane structure is very similar. They're also sensitive to similar antibiotics due to the high similarity of many of their structures to prokaryotes and they divide through binary fission. And maybe our best piece of evidence is that their genomic uh, content, their DNA and their RNA sequences are, uh, have the highest sequence similarity, which is called phylogenetics, by the way, to prokaryotes. And just like uh, 23 and me, or just like a paternity test can take your DNA sequence and then see how similar it is to your offspring or to your mother or your father or to a sister or brother or anything else. Um, they can determine how closely re you are related to each one of those individuals. Scientists can do the same thing at a higher level. So they can do the same thing from species to species, genus to genus, um, domain to domain, and they can even do it with the DNA that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts contain. And believe it or not, yes, they have much higher sequence similarity to that of prokaryotes than they do to eukaryotes. And again, this isn't, this isn't up for debate. The prokaryotic lineage is so vastly and different than our own. And it branched off as far back as we can record a branching off event. Um, that it's not like, you know, you're comparing uh, um, something that's close, like orange to red. We're talking about comparing, you know, one side of the spectrum, UV light to infrared light. They're just completely different in sequence. So here's, uh, here's a very basic outline of the endosymbiotic theory relating to a photosynthetic eukaryote. So they think what first happened is we had a proto-eukaryote cell. This cell began to have infoldings of the plasma membrane, which is the inner membrane of the cell. And eventually these gave rise to endomembrane components. So sort of our uh, original, our OG um, nucleus and things like endoplasmic reticulum. In step two, the first endosymbiotic event occurred 
where that ancestral eukaryote, you know, maybe it's maybe it was a grazer. A grazer is something that eats other organisms around it. So maybe that consumed an aerobic bacteria. Um, it could even be have been infected by an intracellular parasitic bacterium. But nonetheless, that bacterium was either consumed or it was in that proto eukaryotic cell was by that bacterium. And um, in a second endosymbiotic event, that early eukaryote uh, consumed a photosynthetic bacteria. And both of these bacteria, the aerobic bacteria, um, eventually, maybe it was a, uh, a, a bacterium that um, over time started to become more uh, symbiotic with that cell. So in other words, maybe that cell prote provided protection from outside forces, from outside predation. Uh, maybe it helped uh, move it up and down in the, the water column to safety. And so it gained an advantage living inside of that cell and the cell gained an advantage by that bacterium producing something it needed. Namely in mitochondria, it produced uh, energy. And for the photosynthetic bacterium in step number three, that probably provided um, energy as well in the form of photosynthesis. And it could have also um, fixed carbon for it as well. As we see with algae and plants, they fix carbon dioxide in the air and make organic molecules out of them. So here at the bottom, we have the modern uh, heterotrophic eukaryote. This is like you and I. Um, it didn't go the further step of getting that photosynthetic bacterium and creating the modern photosynthetic eukaryote like algae and plants. Again, this is just a list of all of those uh, different traits. So, checkpoint four. Name two organelles that are thought to have been derived through endosymbiosis. Now checkpoint five. Name three specific traits that suggest mitochondria are the descendants of bacteria. Now endosymbiosis theory is not some relic of the past. Of course, we see it with mitochondria and bacteria but it is also an ongoing process that occurs in many different organisms in many different ways. Here is just a brief non-exhaustive list of different sorts of organisms that have these endosymbiotes that live with them. Um, Dr. Guile works at ASU and I have worked with both of these scientists in studying uh, endosymbiosis. And uh, they had this paper that they put out, uh, it was about a year ago, two years ago. So we can see, for example, primary algae, the Paulina, uh, Paulinella chromatophora um, has endosymbiotes that are can be transient or permanent. So they can go in, kind of live around in here and then eventually come out. So this Paulina chromatophora actually consumes um, uh, cyanobacteria that can live in and out of the host. For B, we have a type of green alga and it does sort of the same thing. In C, we have a different type of alga. It's called red alga, which has consumed a different type of uh, plastid, which has a different type of plastid that is, it's not a chloroplast, but it's related once again in that phylogenetic tree to chloroplasts. D, again, it has its own sort of uh, plastids that are related to chloroplasts. Um, and, and many others, as you see throughout this list. Um, Greg is probably most well known for his publication in Nature. The title is, I like oscilloids are built from different endosymbiotically acquired components. So 
in this image here, you have actually a single cell. Okay, so this is not an eye. If you don't be confused with an eye because an eye is made up of many, many, many different types of cells, right? This is just a single cell, but it has an eye-like apparatus it uses to detect light. And this apparatus is composed of a variety of different plastids and pigments that it gets from either consuming uh, cyanobacteria and algae or uh, degrading their components and actually using their individual um, pigments. And from this, uh, it has something that is a type of a cornea and it can form a, a type of lens, a retinal body and uh, the, with a top and a bottom to it. So this very complex structure through endosymbiosis. And by the way, um, it's not going to be necessary for the exam for you to memorize all of these different types. You do need to be aware of the uh, mitochondria and the chloroplasts and the detail we covered. I pulled up this uh, publication that was uh, published in 2016 from the Microbiology to Cell Biology, where an intracellular bacterium becomes part of the host cell. And what this paper did is it, it measured the genome sizes. So how big is all of the DNA sequence of an, or of an organism, right? And it looked at the genome sizes of mitochondria of different plastid genomes. It looked at also insects, believe it or not, have endosymbionts as well, which we'll discuss shortly. And then it compared them to their ancestors, which are the bacterial genomes. And on the x-axis, we see this is the length of the genome. And then on the y-axis is the number of protein coding genes. And what they hypothesize in this paper is the longer ago, the, the further back in history that the, this endosymbiotic event occurred, that the more um, degraded and the shorter the genome size would become. And this is because of a simple fact that the longer that that endosymbiont lives um, in harmony with a eukaryotic cell, the more of the tasks tend to be relegated to the cell's main genome, its main chromosomes, instead of being within the endosymbiont. And scientists believe that's because uh, the cell is a little bit better off if it has better control over the regulation of the expression of that genome. So as we covered in our hypothetical, you know, uh, steps for endosymbiosis for a plant, the first step was the mitochondrial genome went in. And as we can see, this is the smallest in the genome size, has the fewest number of protein coding genes. Then the plastids went in. So those were the next ones. But probably the newest type of endosymbiotic events that are occurring in life on Earth now, that are kind of the, the hot uh, topic in um, endosymbiosis, are insect endosymbiont genomes. So uh, often you see these plant-sucking insects, such as the mealy bug, um, that are living on things like potatoes, or you might have seen them out in your yards on your plants. Now, they, they survive solely on sucking nutrients out of plants, but Unfortunately, eukaryotes tend to not be very good at making all of their nutrients. Um, take us, for example, we have many essential amino acids we have to consume, many essential fats that we need to consume. Um, we need uh, bacterium and microbes in our gut to produce essential vitamins for us. And bacteria, however, are really good at making all of these nutrients. That's kind of where these nutrients come from in the first place. So these, uh, these plant-sucking insects, such as mealybugs, have endosymbionts. So these aren't bacterium that live in their digestive tract. These are bacteria or endosymbionts that live inside of the cells, just as our mitochondrion lives inside of our cells. So essentially they have worked out a deal with bacterium 
to synthesize those nutrients such as certain amino acids from their food sources and in exchange they provide a environment for them to survive and thrive and multiply with the new generations of millibugs. So this is where things get a little weird. So um, what's so crazy about this is, so here's our example of our uh, host cell, right? Here we have the host, which would be like, you know, our cells or the host to the mitochondrion and the bacteria. So the host has its own nucleus and genome, right? Right here beside it. And then it has one of these endosymbionts which is this uh, orange or yellowish orange uh, box right here. But within this um, endosymbiont, this endosymbiont picked up another endosymbiont. So here we have a, a turtles all the way down. How many endosymbionts in endosymbionts can you have? And this, this uh, endosymbiont it needs to be able to make peptidoglycan it's, it's uh, for whatever reason it's found it's still essential for making peptidoglycan and here's the metabolic pathway for making peptidoglycan you need all of these different uh, genes to be expressed right so um, in the chromosome of this endosymbiont it has some genes that it's maintained but it has some genes that are from organisms that don't even exist in this cell. So in other words, somehow it picked up genes from the environment and put it into its own chromosome. Okay. And sometimes it has genes from the endosymbiont that lives within the endosymbiont. And moreover, some of these genes, remember we talked about the chromosomes shrinking over time. Well, some of these genes actually got kicked out of the, the chromosome of the endosymbiont and then the host chromosome picked up those genes and now it transcribes genes to make peptidoglycan for that endosymbiont, that Morinella inner membrane here. Um, and we know that because the genes are related to the organisms that are related to the endosymbiont and uh, insects don't have peptidoglycan, remember? They don't have cell walls. So as we can see here, um, the, 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 the process of endosymbiosis is an ongoing one. Um, it's complicated. Uh, it's very hard to study. And um, interestingly enough, no matter how difficult a task might be, like making peptidoglycan as an endosymbiont, life tends to find a way. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.